Hello and welcome to Arts in the City. I'm Magalie Laguerre Wilkinson. We're here at the Museum of the Moving Image in Astoria, Queens. And a bit later in the program, we're going to tell you about a wonderful exhibit. But first, a very personal story about the journey of one man who survived the horrors of the Holocaust and became an artist. Donna Hanover has the story of Frederick Turner and his art. One of the themes that come back again and again is the fire of the chimney of, in Auschwitz. Frederick Turner is one of a dramatically dwindling number of concentration camp survivors still living to tell what happened in the Holocaust. Now, for instance, that painting there, it's the opening of an oven in Auschwitz of the crematorium, and the flames are forming the letter Shin, Shesh in Hebrew. Mm -hmm. And Shin and Shin, the word Shesh means six, six, so it's six million. Six million. I've used paintings shamelessly as a way of getting rid of stuff. Catharsis? Catharsis, yes, very much so. Fred was raised in Prague. His mother died when he was nine, but he and younger brother Tommy otherwise had a good life with their dad and their grandparents. Then the Nazis invaded. They sent Tommy to his death at Treblinka at age 16. Fred and his father ended up at Theresienstadt, a show camp the Nazis used to mislead the Red Cross into believing the Jews were being treated well. That's where Fred first started to draw. In 1944, Fred was transported to Auschwitz and was assigned to do slave labor. He didn't know then that his father was in the next transport and was killed immediately. In Auschwitz you arrive, everything is stripped of you, but there was sand and use a stick or a twig or something and throw in it. And uh, if somebody was nearby that look dangerous, you know, kick the boat and uh, the, the thing disappears. So sand is often mixed with pigment and acrylic to give his surfaces texture. Fred's final camp was Koffering, where 90% of the prisoners died. I was liberated on April 27th, 1945. I was one of those shuffling skeletons. The only survivor in his family, Fred began to draw about his experiences while recuperating in the hospital. He went on to marry another survivor and artist, Stella Horner, and they escaped the communists to develop their craft in Paris. They moved first to Canada and then the U.S. in the early 50s. For decades, most of his work was dark and fiery, and then about 10 years ago, something changed. And one day I said, that's it, I'm going to turn 180 degrees around, and what was black will become bright, what was red will become green, and it's still the same painting, but on the positive side. Now in his 90s, Fred continues to paint. Many of his themes have a dark and light side. Dark circles represent being restrained in a concentration camp, but light ones represent unity, comfort of the womb, and femininity. As for the piece with a beautiful temple that he's working on now, the temple started out as an execution war. The theme of walls suddenly having gates for escape comes up often. His paintings are also meant to be touched. When I paint, I use surface, line, shape, color to express, but I, um, I want to include the surface mm -hmm. because we live by touch. A baby lives by touch for a I'm long, very long tempted. Time. Tempted? I should touch? Touch, yes. Since I mix everything myself, mm -hmm. I'm very comfortable doing what I just did. Fred's work has been shown in galleries and is in private collections. He's also created stained glass windows for synagogues. He was featured in the documentary As Seen Through These Eyes, narrated by Maya Angelou about artists in the camps. Even the smallest sketch gave the artist a sense of control and freedom. There are times when you feel happy, joyous, that you've come through the other side? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, uh, doesn't mean that I don't have nightmares. I do have them. I'm going to deal with it, not running away from it. So that may be in the art. If people read it that way, wonderful. 
When he was 64, Fred and his second wife, Dr. Rebecca Schiffman, became parents to Daniel, who is now a graduate student in art. He's made photographic portraits of his parents and also a film about his father's first wife. Somebody said there was a young lady that had asked for you. This is the address. I went there, rang the doorbell, and there was Stella. I'm more interested in like what happened afterward. Like, who did he fall in love with? What was it like to cope, to live in New York City with this trauma? Back in 1944, Fred left some sketches at Theresienstadt in a hidden box. He thought they were lost forever. But on a 1982 trip to Israel, he visited a kibbutz founded by some of the camp's survivors and discovered that several of his works had been saved. He also has a painting in Yad Vashem, Israel's Holocaust Museum. You have been quoted as saying, in a way, your work is uh, completing a promise. While in the camps, we said to each other, the one who survives is going to tell the story. And I tell the story as well as I can, as often as I can, as often as my emotions allow me. So these decades of work by Frederick Turner are a promise kept. I'm Donna Hanover for Arts in the City. As we've just seen, art can make indelible images on our brains and is often the reflection of the artist. Tina Beth Pina found one woman who uses her art to make people more conscious of societal injustice. Art can stimulate different parts of our brains. It can make us laugh, it can make us cry, or make us think of things we would have never imagined. So what if an artist used her art to not only spark our imaginations, but to transform our social consciousness? I met one artist who's doing just that. I'm an activist, artist, feminist, Jew, lesbian. That's for starters. Meet Linda Stein, an artist whose work pushes boundaries and conjures up images of power and courage in a post 9-11 world. This art that you're seeing here was originally inspired by 9-11. And that day, the running and desire for protection started mulling around in my brain. And I realized that much of my life was about protection. Much of my art that I did before this was about protection. Then I started making some of the work you see around here. And then Wonder Woman came to mind. And when I thought of Wonder Woman, I said to myself, yes, she is symbolic of what I'm trying to do. Wonder Woman is featured prominently in some of Linda Stein's sculptural figures and wearable armor, inviting its viewers to feel empowered by conveying strength and justice in contemporary culture. Everything we do falls under the umbrella of Have Art Will Travel, subtitled for gender justice, which includes racism, sexism, homophobia, ableism, classism. So we're all about authenticity. One exhibit called the fluidity of gender that's going around to these 24 universities and museums. And that is works that have to do with this idea of masculinity and femininity being fused together. And it has wearable sculpture. And they sometimes, many times, experience what it feels like to have a new avatar, a new body on, and to feel what it's like to be armored, so to speak. The sculptures and wearable art are made out of acrylicized metallic paper, leather, copper, as well as found objects like driftwood, metal, and stone. I love the idea of doing it in every material. That's what excites me. So I want to make this vision of an empowered, heroic, armored female, male, because they're androgynous and I combine both the feminine and the masculine, and I want to do it in any material I could possibly think of. There's a series called I Am the Environment, where I go to the beach and I pick shells, and then I make torsos using just shells, or using beans, or using 
Sticks and Stones, and one sculpture is called Sticks and Stones. And I like that because you have the double entendre of anti-bullying and the art. Were you ever a bully growing up? Not only was I bullied, but I realized after lecturing on it that I was a bully. That bullying experience led Linda to create a series of bully-proof vests. I'm wearing one right now. They are called bully-proof, not bulletproof. Bully-proof vests, they're numbered, they're signed, and they're dated. And I use icons of protection. So I have images of Wonder Woman, Princess Mononoke, who's a Japanese anime character. Um, sometimes I use people from pop culture, Lady Gaga, Storm from comic books, Lisbeth Salander from The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo. These are all pop culture icons that can start a conversation about bravery. Linda is currently creating another series based on bravery called Holocaust Heroes, Fierce Females, and it features tapestries with women who have risked their lives to save others. It's clearly a major theme that runs through all of Linda's work. I want very much for people that view this and hear my lecture to think about their own bravery and to think what it takes for them to do some acts in their lives they may not even think of as brave, but really are very brave. I'm Tina Beth Pina for Arts in the City. And art can also make us laugh and escape the real world, if only for a moment. While some may not consider cartoons as a form of art, those very cartoons are part of most of our childhoods. Tony Gaida takes us on a tour right here at the Museum of the Moving Image of the exhibit of Chuck Jones, the famed artist and director of some very iconic images. Meep. What's up, Doc? Bugs Bunny. <laughs> the Road Runner and Wiley Coyote, and Peppy the Pew, Daffy Duck, and Elmer Fudd. I say it's duck season, and I say fire! Immortal characters brought to life by a pioneer and master of Hollywood animation, Chuck Jones. He's a part of what I like to call American's visual Rolodex. Cheryl Washer of the Smithsonian Institution, one of the partners in the Chuck Jones exhibit. He created some of the most memorable characters in our lives. Absolutely. And you identify with them, you know. Some days you're on top of the world and you're Bugs Bunny. Some days nothing goes right and you're Daffy Duck. Some days nothing really goes right and you're Wile E. Coyote. 23 of Jones's animated films are here to make a visitor laugh and 125 of his original sketches to make an observer think. What's so exciting for us is that we're able to include in the exhibition not just the full cartoon, which, you know, is, is so great, um, but also so much of the artwork that was used to create it. Barbara Miller of the Museum of the Moving Image showed me a panel of Jones's layout drawings for one of his classics. It's towards the beginning of One Froggy Evening where the construction worker finds the, uh, the frog in the box who stubbornly won't sing for anyone but him. I've seen this cartoon, I don't know how many times, so many times. Hello, my baby, hello, my honey, hello, my ragtime gal. And every time I watch it, I'm rooting for the, the construction worker to have that frog just please try and sing in front of someone else so that um, other people know that he's not crazy. Steven Spielberg knew Jones wasn't crazy when he created this frog. I, I think there's no cartoon that holds a candle to that, ever. Nothing's ever come close. That's the Citizen Kane of the animated short. Chuck Jones was a precocious child, taught himself to read at age three. At seven, he discovered Mark Twain's book, Roughin' It. It inspired Jones' most comical villain. About, uh, I'd say, a quarter of the way into the book, there is this description of a coyote. And it says it's a long, slim, sick, and sorry looking skeleton with a gray wolf skin pulled over it. It was the allegory of want. Each of his characters carried some of Jones's DNA, 
Wiley reflected his klutziness with technology. Pepe Le Pew embodied his teenage lady killer fantasies. Bugs Bunny always triumphant, and Daffy Duck usually bumbling with a yin and yang of Jones's soul. He dreamed of being Bugs Bunny, but he'd wake up in the morning and look in the mirror and see Daffy Duck. Right. After 30 years of drawing Daffy and Bugs and the gang, Jones moved to the second act of his life, bringing to television Dr. Seuss's Grinch in a memorable half-hour special. You're a mean one, Mr. Grinch. The exhibition also reminds us that Jones's films were made not for children and not for Saturday morning television. Movie studios demanded something to show in theaters before the feature film came on, an appetizer. The bosses didn't care what the animators produced as long as it was on time and under their very stingy budgets. The studios asked only for filler. Jones and his colleagues gave them art. Think about when these things were in their heyday in the 30s and 40s and there was the depression and there was the war and then you take an audience and in six minutes you make them laugh and someone along the way, I think, forgot to tell the filmmakers and the studios that there is a critical element to these cartoons that go beyond just filler. Accepting his Oscar for Lifetime Achievement in 1996, Chuck Jones said, I stand guilty of directing more than 300 cartoons over the past 50 years. I guess this means you've forgiven me. No forgiveness necessary, Mr. Jones. That's all, folks. I'm Tony Guida for Arts in the City. If you want to get up close and personal with that great white shark and stay safe at the same time, Andrew Falzone has the place for you. This summer, boaters off the beach in Rockaway, Queens had some up-close experiences with the great white shark. Here at the American Museum of Natural History, you can experience the largest ocean predator in IMAX 3D, all from the safety of your own movie seat. If you've ever wanted to get into a cage with the largest living predatory fish, Great White Shark 3D is the next best thing. You don't need to travel all the way to Seal Island, South Africa. In IMAX 3D, the sharks come to you with a level of clarity and detail that may give you goosebumps. The film has quickly become one of the museum's more popular exhibits, according to Brad Harris, Senior Director of Visitor Services. This one is probably one of the highest so far, could be because of 3D. Um, but we think it's also because of the topic. And while we may be curious about great whites, it seems that they have an interest in us as well. This summer, fishermen off of Rockaway Queens reeled in this juvenile great white, and other boaters in the area have reported encounters with similar sized sharks. Dr. Chris Lowe is a shark researcher at Cal State University at Long Beach and was a scientific consultant for the film. Encounters like this one in New York and great white territories across the globe may be an indicator that almost two decades of conservation efforts are finally paying off. So I've talked with colleagues in Australia and South Africa and they think they're seeing some of the same trends that we're seeing here. So it, they've been protected in those countries for 15 years. And the generation time of a white shark takes 15 years for them to reach sexual maturity. So it kind of makes sense that we should start to see more individuals if all this conservation is actually working. Despite 15 years of protection across the world, great whites are still considered vulnerable to extinction. Conservation is one of the key themes throughout the film, which underwent an evaluation for accuracy before going on exhibit. We have the scientists look at them and you know check them for content, make sure that they're accurate. The film was shot across three continents and takes a very clear stand in defense of an animal that has been otherwise labeled a mindless killer. From time to time, they do come close inshore with the possibility of human interaction. But you are more likely to be killed by falling out of bed than by any shot. The film runs 40 minutes, as is typical of an IMAX 3D documentary, making it long enough to tell a story, but short enough to hold the attention of kids eight and up. And since the film has omitted many of the shark attack scenes that have become commonplace in Hollywood and cable TV programming, parents can bring their kids to see the film without fear of shark attack nightmares. Sharknado or, uh, is the, the um, dramatization, if you will, or 
of, of, of uh, the shark. Eventually, people will look past those movies and find out um, one know more about it. And we hope that they come to us for that that, that information. After the 3D movie experience is over, visitors can head to the museum's Milstein Hall of Ocean Life, which includes its renowned 94-foot replica of a blue whale and life-size replica of a great white shark. You can also touch a replica of a megalodon tooth, an ancient great white ancestor estimated at 65 feet, three times the size of its contemporary cousins. Great White Shark 3D will be playing here at the American Museum of Natural History until January 7, 2015. I'm Andrew Falzone for Arts in the City. What do Will Ferrell, Amy Poehler, Sasha Baron Cohen, and Melissa McCarthy have in common? They're just a few of the newer links in a 100-year-old chain of fools. Barry Mitchell has the story. Step right up, ladies and gentlemen, I know I have. Here at the Coney Island USA Museum, we're talking with Trav S.D., the author of Chain of Fools, Silent Comedy and Its Legacies from Nickelodeons to YouTube. Hi, Trav. Hi, Barry. Why are we talking about silent film comedy in an amusement park museum? In the early days of movies and silent comedies, they were mostly shown at places like amusement park arcades and Nickelodeons and palaces of fun. Slapstick comedy is physical action. People hitting each other or people falling down. It's comedy that doesn't necessarily require dialogue, but it, we associate it with clowning. Originally, you'd watch it on a little box, almost like we do today with YouTube. It, it was a solo experience, as opposed to sitting in an audience where it's projected. The Keystone Cops were a feature in a lot of movies of Max Sennett. It was the producer of the first all-comedy studio called Keystone. They probably caused more trouble than that they would help with. Put your fingers out like that. Now hold your arms out that way. On your mark, get set, go! <laughs> oh! oh. <laughs> So Travis, why do we laugh at the cruelty of slapstick comedy? Well, I think it's less about cruelty and violence and more like the unexpected and the surprising and the distorted and the weird happening. So this giant coin says, in freaks we trust, who would qualify as a silent film freak? There one springs to mind, Ben Turpin, the cross-eyed comedian. He actually had his face uh, insured with Lloyds of London so that if the eyes uncrossed, they would recoup millions of dollars. Charlie Chaplin was this huge star, became a millionaire practically overnight. Long about 1916, Charlie Chaplin had acquired enough power that he started building story instead of him just falling down all the time. But they often call that quality pathos, where you would feel very sorry for his tramp when he didn't have a lot to eat or he got beat on the head and there would be a story to it. And Buster Keaton was no less an artist, but he came from a background of slapstick acrobat. Keaton would never laugh or shed a tear, almost like you were wearing a mask. He'd never break a smile no matter what happened and that in itself would become a joke. Who is a silent film comedian that we should know about today that has been completely forgotten? One I would plug is a comedian. Her name's Mabel Normand. Does that name ring a bell for you? Uh, Robert Preston, Bernadette Peters, Mac and Mabel. Yes, that's right. On yeah, Broadway. They, yeah, they a made flop. a musical show. <laughs> yeah, not the best musical, but a good story. She was one of the first female film directors. She was uh, Mac Sennett's uh, key comedian. In fact, she was a bigger star than Chaplin when Chaplin came to Keystone Studios. And if you watch a lot of early Chaplin movies, it's called Mabel Does This or Mabel Does That, Mabel's Busy Day. Wake up, partner. It's time for birthing class. Yay! Who would be today's heirs to the tradition of Mabel Normand? Tina Fey or Amy Poehler. They're willing to lose their class in order to get a laugh. How many of you are planning on using toxic Western medications to drug your baby for your own selfish comfort? Anyone? <laughs> Some people will disagree with me, but I love Sasha Baron Cohen. For example, in Borat, he's kind of an ignorant peasant and he gets on 
to an escalator. And he plays it, it's kind of Keaton-esque, very straight. That to me seems like a worthy echo of silent comedy. There is a beauty and an art to slapstick comedy. And then there were other slapstick comedians who were just hacks. Travis, thanks so much for the interview. It was terrific. Well, what, you mean it's over already? It's only 10 minutes long? Oh, it won't be 10 minutes. Oh, I should hope not. No, when we cut it down, it'll be three or four. Three or You can catch Trav S.D. performing next month in the play Dead and Dummy at the Coney Island USA Museum. A tiny bit of cute can go a long way on Broadway, especially if you have nine lives. Auditions are nothing new for Broadway, but this is a pretty special session. One of this season's new shows, You Can't Take It With You, is holding kitten auditions to find the perfect feline actor to be in the show. Tony winner Bill Berloni, animal trainer and director of animal behavior at the Humane Society of New York, has trained countless animals for the stage and each has a unique set of requirements, especially kittens. The behavior is the curtain goes up and they have to sit on this training game for six and a half minutes without jumping off and you're typing furiously. We're not going to do the whole six and a half minutes because I don't need to see the whole six and a half minutes. What I do need to see is their initial reaction to chaos. That's what I'm here to assess today. For me as a behaviorist, I look for the initial reaction, and his reaction was completely, I don't care. So once we do it 10 times, you know, 20 times, he'll be even more used to it. So he'll get it the quickest. There's also an additional benefit for these furry actors who are currently without a loving home. Unfortunately, there are so many unwanted animals who have already gone through that stress of being uprooted and, and not knowing where they are, are that we bring them into this situation, we treat them nice, we socialize them, they actually fall in love with us. So it, it, it tends not only to save their life, but you know, it's for the first time ever they're being treated well. Bill works exclusively with shelter animals for stage, and all of these kittens, whether picked to be the star or not, are available for adoption. But while playing with kittens is always fun, it was down to business for director Scott Ellis. I swear we're actually auditioning them now. We're going to figure out which kittens we like and which ones we think will uh, work in the show. I like the look. I like the color. I like he did absolutely nothing except eat. And... So there you have it, Alfonso the star. And if you're interested in rescuing a kitten or any other animal from the Humane Society of New York, you can log on to humanesocietyny.org. And next month, Pat Collins takes us behind the scenes with all the stars of the Broadway show, You Can't Take It With You. That's our show for today. I'm Magalie Laguerre-Wilkinson, and we'll see you next month on Arts in the City.